NMIT presents Lecture 6 on the topic of photosynthesis. This lecture is part of the plant physiology subject which is a component of the agricultural and viticultural degree programs offered at NMIT. Please refer to the recommended reading from Tays and Zeiger, Chapter 7 for complementary information. There are two lectures on the subject of photosynthesis. This is Lecture 1 where we will be con concentrating on the light reactions. In Lecture 2, we'll be concentrating on the Calvin cycle. My name's Nikki Cooley. My name is Nikki Cooley, and this is a presentation by NMIT on Part 2 of the lecture on photosynthesis, the light reactions. Please ensure that you watch Part 1 before you watch Part 2. In Part 2, we are going to cover the process of conversion of light energy into chemical energy. This occurs in the thylakoid membranes and we will examine the electron chain reactions in some detail. The conversion of energy in, from light into chemical has great significance for agriculture and we shall end this lecture looking at some of these examples and the importance of this process. So, let's start by looking at some of the compounds. The compound on your screen, top left hand side, is ATP or also known as adenosine triphosphate. This is a very important compound for life on Earth. The left hand side shows the chemical formula and structure. The right hand side is a modelled illustration of this structure. ATP is produced from the compound adenosine diphosphate or ADP. This is illustrated below. In this image on the slide, you can see both ADB and ATP next to each other. The grey area or ribose area shows the differences in these forms between the two groups, which is essentially a phosphate group. So, ADP plus an inorganic phosphate group gives you ATP. When you see the molecule ADP, you will note it's in the oxidized form. <clears throat> when the inorganic phosphate is added and ATP is created, this is called the reduced form. On your screen, on the right hand side, just for a reminder, I have placed an atom. In the center of the atom is the nucleus. And orbiting around the nucleus, are electrons. On the right hand side the, there is an image of ADB and NATP. The grey area shows the regional differences between these two. Here we have the reaction of adenosine triphosphate. So converting adenosine diphosphate to adenosine triphosphate involves the addition of a phosphate group or electron. So we say when you can couple ADP with inorganic phosphate you gain an electron to produce ATP. We also describe ADP as in the oxidized form and when ADP has gained an electron we describe it in the reduced form. The process of generating ATP is called cyclic photophosphorylation as it uses light directly to generate the ATP. The energized electrons cycle through an electron transport chain and return to the original chloroform form. This is a true cycle. Cyclic photophosphorylation takes place in the thylakoid membrane of the chloroplast. It is important to know that photosystem 2 is not involved in cyclic photophosphorylation. During photosynthesis in plants, there are two photosystems, photosystem 1 and photosystem 2. The terminology of these is slightly confusing, as they were named after the order they were discovered in and not the order of the reaction. Therefore, the reaction starts with photosystem 2 and then goes to photosystem 1. In the capture of light energy, a number of centres in the membrane called photosystems work in a chain-like manner. 
Electrons excited out of the reaction centre in the photosystems are carried along a chain. The chain pumps proteins, just like the respiratory complexes, and the electrons are eventually dumped onto a compound called NADP, which is converted into another form, NADPH. Photons flow back through the ATP synthase, generating ATP. This is a summary of photosynthesis. So let's look at this summary in a little bit more detail using a diagram. The process of the light reaction is referred to as the Z scheme. And then this is followed by the non-light requiring or Kelvin cycle. In this figure, we have a representation of both the Z scheme and the Kelvin cycle and how they interact. So let us start from the beginning. Light hits photosystem 2. The energy from this light enables the splitting of water and the electron to pass down the electron transport train. The electron is energized again by light in the photosystem 1 and the compound NADPH is produced from NADP. While this reaction is occurring, hydrogen ions are binding up in the thylakoid membrane. The only direction they can travel is through a complex called ATP synthase. Once they pass through this, they will produce ATP. ATP synthase is not illustrated on this diagram. The NADP and ADP is then used for energy in the Calvin cycle, which allows the production of sugars. On this slide is another visualisation of the Z scheme and the process of electron transport. This diagram particularly demonstrates the role of redox potential in this reaction. Water is splitting in photosystem 2 and it is using light at a specific wavelength, 680 nanometers. Sometimes this is referred to as the P680 center. The wavelength excites the electron, which is transported along the electron transport chain until it reaches photosystem 1. This time in photosystem 1, more light at a slightly different wavelength this time, 700, is excited and the ele electron is then used to convert NADP to NADPH. The conversion of NADP to NADPH occurs in the stroma, where it is available for the Calvin cycle. The photosystems are composed of antenna pigment molecules and energy can be passed from one antenna to the next. Ferrodoxin is an example of one of these compounds. I like this figure as it simply demonstrates the products of photosynthesis. In the light reaction you have NADP converted to ATP. You also have the conversion of NADP to NADPH, which is then used in the dark reactions. The byproducts of the light reaction are water and oxygen. The byproducts of the dark reactions are sugars and carbon dioxide. As you may have realized, light is an essential component of the light reactions of photosynthesis. And it has certain properties which are summarized in this diagram. You can see that the type of radiation, light, lies between the ultraviolet and the infrared spectrum. And that this spectrum is related to energy. Therefore, there is more energy at the 400 than there is at the 700 end of the spectrum. It is the interaction of light and the pigments in photosynthesis which enable these reactions to occur. Let us talk about one of these pigments, chlorophyll. This is probably the most important molecule in the light reaction. On the left hand side of the screen you will see the molecular formula for chlorophyll. And as I'm sure you can see, 
it is a very complicated compound. On the right hand side of the screen you can see what's called an action spectrum of chlorophyll A. Action spectrums are visualizations of where light is absorbed. You will see that chlorophyll A absorbs light mostly at 4 to 9 nanometers and then again at 659. Areas between 5 and 600 nanometers are hardly absorbed at all and areas above 700 and 400 are also not absorbed. Chlorophyll absorbs molecules as individual photons. Each can cause a single photochemical reaction. If there is no direct photochemical reaction, chlorophyll may lose its excitation energy as heat and red fluorescence. So this is a waste basically. A fluorescence, in fluorescence, a high energy or short wavelength photon is absorbed, which promotes an electron. The electron then drops to the lowest vibrational substate of the excited state. So this is the technical chemical terms for what is going on. Once the electron has fallen, it releases heat, and then it drops to its ground state, emitting a photon of lower energy or longer wavelength than was originally absorbed. So what does all this mean? Well put simply, it means that chlorophyll A absorbs solar radiation in only small regions of the light spectrum. In the figure on the slide, you will see the solar output from the sun. You will see the amount of energy in red that hits the Earth's surface and then finally in green you will see the amount of absorption by chlorophyll. Chlorophyll absorbs strongly in the blue and the red regions. Green light is not efficiently absorbed and thus reflected into our eyes giving plants their characteristic green color although there is some debate about the color. Chlorophyll absorbs light and then it goes into a higher energy state. When it's in this higher energy, or it's often referred to as excited state, it is extremely unstable. And it is this characteristic which allows the chlorophyll to give up the energy so readily to its surroundings as heat. There are four alternative pathways for disposing of its energy. It can re-emit a photon, and this is called fluorescence. It can convert the photon energy into heat. It may participate in energy transfer. Remember, energy is never lost, it's only transferred. Or fourthly, energy causes a chemical reactions to occur, and this is photochemistry. Chlorophyll A, which we have been talking about, is one photosynthetic pigment, but there are others. Chlorophyll B is another photosynthetic pigment, and so are the carotenoid pigments. On your slide, you will see some molecular structures of these compounds. Energy of sunlight is absorbed by pigments of the plant. Chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B are abundant in green plants. There are also chlorophyll C and D, and these are found in protists and cyanobacteria. All chlorophylls have what's called a poropyrene-like ring structure with a magnesium atom and a long hydrocarbon tail. Carotenoid pigments, another set of photosynthetic pigments, are all linear molecules with multiple double bonds. For example, carotene is an example of a carotenoid pigment. Carotenes transfer their light energy to chlorophyll, thus known as accessory pigments. Action spectrums are very useful to photobiologists. They show the magnitude of response of a biological system, and it can be any system, to light as a function of wavelength. In the image, we have an action spectrum. This is showing the chromophore pigment responsible for light absorption. And it also shows where the light is being absorbed. You can see from this figure that between 400 and 500 nanometers, light is being used. And again, between 650 and 690. Quantum efficiency is nearly 
almost all absorbed photons, photons engage in photochemistry. If quantum efficiency was less, then less photons would be engaged in photosynthesis, phot photochemistry. Energy efficiency is about 27%. It's only a fourth of the energy is stored, the remainder is converted to heat, and this is waste. Here is another example on the slide of an action spectrum. This action spectrum is of a, a response of the plant Bellis perennis, commonly known as daisy. On the axes you have relative quantum efficiency and wavelength. This action spectrum is showing that there is a 10% inhibition of photosynthetic rate at wavelengths of radiation that are in the UV spectrum. This demonstrates that light can not only um, in, uh, promote photosynthesis, but certain regions of light can inhibit photosynthetic rate. This is important in agriculture to understand how light can alter photosynthetic rates. In light harvesting complex, the majority of pigments serve as an antennae complex, collecting light and transferring energy to the reaction center complex. To understand this process, it is important to know that only one molecule of oxygen is produced for each 2,500 chloroform molecules in the same sample. Thus, several hundred pigments associated with each reaction center. It's very complex. Each reaction center must operate four times to produce one mole of oxygen. Therefore, in summary, 2,500 chlorophylls per oxygen. The process of these photosynthetic centres is very complex. On the screen in front of you there is a model visualisation of a pigment arrangement from photosystem 2. The pigment molecules are arranged in blocks of about mm -hmm. 50 and these are the antennae. These channel energy to a centre chlorophyll A molecule the reaction centre, where the photochemical reactions occurs. The excited chlorophyll A ejects an electron, becoming an extremely strong oxidising agent capable of pulling electrons out of the water. The antennae plus the reaction centre taken together are termed as the photosystem. This is another model of one antennae structure. I have shown this so you can see the complexities of the molecules that make up these centres. Photosynthesis has some interesting characteristics. When red and far red light are given together, the rate of photosynthesis is greater than the sum of the individual rates, and this is called the enhancement effect. It is explained by the discovery that there are two photosystem complexes, photosystem 1 and photosystem 2, and that they operate together to carry out these reactions. As we said previously, photosystem 1 prefers the absorption of far red, while photosystem 2 prefers the absorption of red light at 680 nanometers. Also differences is that photosystem 2 produces a strong reductant and a weak oxidant. Photosystem 2 produces a strong oxidant and a weak reductant. So how are photosystem 1 and photosystem 2 organised? Well, predominantly they're located in the gramma lamini. Photosystem 1 and ATP synthase are found almost exclusively in the stroma laminae and at the edges of the gramma laminae. The cytochrome BF complex is very distributed. Thus, the two photochemical events that occur are spatially separated. In the figure on your slide, you can see a visual representation of this arrangement. Spatial separation implies that one or more electron carriers must diffuse from the grana to the stroma to deliver electrons to photosystem 1. In this, two com molecules are, are contributing, plastocyanin, plastocyanin and plastoquinine. In photosystem 2, oxidation of two water molecules in total produces four electrons four protons and one oxygen molecule. The protons must also diffuse to the stroma where ATP is synthesized. 
Function to deliver energy efficiency to the electron centers is quite important. So let's see what these factors are. Size varies considerably. You have about 20 to 30 pigments per reaction center in photosynthetic bacteria. 200 to 300 per center in higher plants. Several thousands in algae and some other bacteria. Mechanism of excitation energy transfer from pigments to the reaction center is called the fluorescence resonance energy transfer or F. RET. Important differences between energy transfer among pigments and electron transfer that occurs in the electron center. Phenophyton is a chlorophyll with two hydrogens and no magnesium and it is an early acceptor of electrons in photosystem 2. Electrons from photosystem 2 are passed to a complex of two plastoquinines PQA and PQB, which are bound to the reaction centre. In this figure you can see a visual represent representation of the functional role of PQ and PQH2. PQB becomes reduced to PQB2 and takes two protons from the stroma, yielding a fully reduced plastohydroquinine. It dissociates from the reaction centre and transfers its electrons to the cytochrome PF complex. Take some time to have a look at the image on this screen as it shows the excited state of pigments. The excited state of pigments increase with the distance that they occur from the reaction centre. Put simply, if a pigment is closer to the reaction centre it is lower in energy. This ensures that the excitation transfer in energy uh, in energetically terms is favorable. Some energy loses heat. This is about 95 to 99% of all energy. This is both a problem for the plant and possibly for agriculture as it does show that not only does the plant have to deal with extra heat but it also is not as efficient as it might be. So let's bring all this together. Almost all the processes that make up the light reactions are carried out by four major protein complexes. There is photosystem 2, cytochrome BF, photosystem 1 and ATP synthase. In summary, photosystem 2 oxidizes water to oxygen in the thylakoid lumen and releases protons into the lumen. The cytochrome BF oxidizes plastohydroquinine and delivers electrons to photosystem 1. Photosystem 1 reduces NADP plus to NADPH in the stroma through the ferrodoxin and FNR complex. ATP synthase produces ATP as protons which diffuse back through into the lumen into the stroma. This slide shows a visual representation of the mechanisms of the electron transport system. You can see the oxidization of water in the photosystem 2 requiring light. You can see the role of plastoquinine in electron transfer. You will observe next the role of cytochrome and the, and the electron transfer here. This is then passed to, pass to plastocyanin which then moves through photosystem 1 to FD and FNR with the production of NADPH from NADP as light as an input. This is the first time we've seen ATP synthase in our cartoon-like diagrams. Here uh, H plus or protons are pumped through the ATPase into the stroma from the lumen. This produces high electrochemical potential gradient. This shows a nice visual representation and summary of the mechanisms of the electron transport. Water is oxidized to oxygen in photosystem 2. On the screen you can see the reaction. Water is very stable, thus it's difficult to oxidize. The photosynthetic oxygen evolving complex is the only known system on Earth that carries out this reaction. Magnesium is an essential cofactor in this process. Elements have shown that chlorine and calcium ions are also essential for oxygen evolution. 
and thus hints at some of the fertigation requirements for photosynthesis. This slide here shows a cartoon representation of cytochrome BF. In the large BF complex, PQH2 is oxidized and one of, the one of the two electrons is passed towards the photosystem 1, while the other cycles to increase the number of photons pumped across the membrane. The first electron is transferred to the plastocyanin, which reduces the oxidized P70 of the photosystem 1. The plastomyoquinone transfers its electron and releases two proteins to the lumen. A second complex, PQH2, is oxidized. One electron transferred to photosystem 1 and one electron is transferred to the plasmomycoquinine or PQH2 while picking up two photons from the stroma. This is a more detailed visualization of photosystem 1 reaction center. The photosystem 1 reaction center contains a core of about 100 chlorophylls and as a core antennae. They form a bowl-like structure surrounding the electron transfer cofactors. Extremely strong reducing agents make up the unstable and difficult to identify. Electron acceptors include iron sulfur proteins, which transfer electrons to ferrodoxine, also called FD, where they are used by FNR to reduce NAD plus to NADPH, thus completing the sequence of non-cyclic electron transport that began with the oxidization of water. ATP synthase is quite an interesting process. It is also known as photophosphorylation and it works via ke uh, chemoosmosis. The basic principle is that the ion concentration differences and the electropotential differences across membranes provide a strong source of energy. This process is called the proton motive force and it powers the ATP synthase. On the slide you can see a visual representation of this process. You can visualize the hydrogen ions from the lumen passing through the ATP synthase via the CFO complex through into the stroma. NADP plus inorganic phosphate enables the production of ATP. We have been exploring now in some detail the mechanisms of photosystem 1 and photosystem 2. And as you will appreciate, they are extremely complicated. So what happens when they go wrong and how does the plant avoid this? Protection and repair of photo damage consists of something called quenching and heat dissipation. It involves the neutralizing of toxic photo products and the synthetic repair of photosystem 2. We have a diagram that sums up this on the slide. This process is really important in agriculture as it reduces photosynthetic efficiencies which can result in reductions of yield. It can also cause significant damage to the plant when this process goes wrong. This process can go wrong with a lack of water or in high temperatures. It can also go wrong in very low temperatures. So why is this so important to agriculture? Why have we spent so much time learning photosynthesis in such detail? Well, put simply, photosynthesis evolved from prokaryotes. Pro pro it was initially evolved in low light conditions in the absence of oxygen. And this may allow for improvements in yield for crops grown in high light conditions. It's a very important aspect of most agronomy in Australia. Photosystem 2 can be damaged by high concentrations of a substrate light. This has been shown by several researchers, including Nishima et al. in 2011 and Murieta in 2012. Photo damaged plants have had to develop a whole set of regulat regulatory and protective responses, and these include processes that dis dissipate excess excitation energy as heat and allow for the rapid repair and turnover of photo damaged photosystem 2 subunits. So does this mean that we can improve photosynthesis? Does this mean that we can reduce photo damage? These two questions are very important and have been the subject of breeding and genetic engineering. 
Here we have table one from a paper that was looking at the process of photosynthetics and if we can improve efficiencies for agriculture. In this summary or review paper, there were certain components of each of the photosynthetic reactions which were believed could be studied in more detail to improve photosynthetic efficiencies. Where research shows us there's great potential for improving photosynthesis and possibly yield, it also opens up the question, so what is the significance of agriculture in the future? One of the future's biggest challenges will be climate change and climate change adaptation. In the figure here we can see some modelling which shows the percentage change of different crops in, climate, in the future in certain climate scenarios. As yield is driven by photosynthesis and water availability is very important in photosynthesis, you may now begin to understand the impact of some of these findings. This brings us to a close of the photosynthesis lecture. So in summary, water is absorbed by roots and translocated to the leaves. Water is split into pure oxygen and hydrogen using the energy of the sun. The oxygen is released and the hydrogen protons are moved into the chloroplast. Hydrogen protons are packed into the thylakoids and in the grana. Hydrogen protons leave the thylakoids where the ATP synthase which is cyclic. The ATP synthase turns NADP and inorganic phosphate into ATP. Carbon dioxide is absorbed by the leaves. ATP is used to combine carbon dioxide and hydrogen into sugar. This is during the Calvin cycle. Functions of glucose are used for energy supply or combined to make other sugars or compounds using ATP. When sugar is utilised by the mitochondria, carbon dioxide and water are released and absorbed by plants. I hope by understanding some of the details of the photosynthetic pathways that you now have a greater understanding of the complexities and therefore the agricultural management of plants and how we may be able to optimise them with current practices and future research. Feel free to look at the YouTube video on the screen. This is produced by Mr. Anderson and relays some of the points covered here. Thank you.